Praise the Lord. Rise up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for the way you are leading us in the Congress. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. We thank you for the hunger you are put in every heart. Hunger for you. Hunger for your characteristics. Hunger for your nature. Hunger for holiness. We pray, Lord, tonight you fulfill your promises in every life. That as we hunger and thirst after righteousness, you'll fill us. Do it in your power. Do it for your glory. Do it for our blessing. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. We're coming back to Romans. And we're looking at the second part of Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. We're reading now from verse 17. Romans 2. Reading from verse 17. All through to the end. That is to verse 29. Romans chapter Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and maketh thy boast in the maketh thy boast in God. Verse 28. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. As we look at those verses, and we look at the presentation of Paul the Apostle. Already we have learned that in chapter 1, he brought conviction on the Gentile world. In chapter 2, his goal, his purpose, what he was driving at, was to bring conviction upon the Jews. And then in chapter 3, he will bring both together. And he will ask the question, is there any righteous one, Jew, Gentile, Gentile, Jew? And it will give the answer in chapter 3 verse 10. There is none righteous, no, not one. Here now he wants to talk to the Jew. And he wants to show that they are totally misplaced. Circumcision that God gave. As a sign, as a token of his relationship and covenant with Abraham and the descendants of Abraham. And you can see in verse 29, the conclusion he comes to make. And he says, for he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And then he says, circumcision is that of the heart, not in the flesh. In the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, not of Pharisees who rejoiced in the fact that we are circumcised on the eighth day, but the praise is of God. That brings us to the message the necessity of heart circumcision. Actually, the Lord. Refer to that, even in the Old Testament, he showed them that his purpose was not just the circumcision of the flesh. The circumcision of the flesh was a pointer to the circumcision of the heart. That's why now Paul the Apostle re-emphasized in verse 29, circumcision is that of the heart. 
whose praise is of God. A circumcised heart draws praise from the Lord. Outward goodness without inward godliness is insufficient to receive God's approval. The circumcision of the heart is described in various ways with clear characteristics. As you look at Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, the Lord made it clear it wasn't just requesting or requiring or demanding flesh, fleshly circumcision. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff necked. You can see the demand of the Lord there. He wanted them to be free from being stiff necked. Deuteronomy chapter 30, reading from verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. It says, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. Already he was telling them, even under the old covenant, that the circumcision made by a man, when he'll take his surgical knife and cut off a part of the redundant flesh that harbors bacteria and all uncleanness, says that's not enough. The fleshly circumcision is not enough. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord. Here is the result. Here is the confidence. Here is the consequence to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. It was a circumcision that brought entire absolute Undivided, unmixed love, devotion, and loyalty to God. It was expressed another way in Psalm 24, reading from verse 4. Psalm 24, reading from verse 4. You'll see the emphasis of the Lord is not the flesh, it's not the circumcision of the flesh, but that of the heart. Psalm 24, verse 3 and verse 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. It's an in what thing? Circumcision is that of the heart. He has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity? Not one deceitfully, Ezekiel chapter 36, reading from verse 26, Ezekiel chapter 36. As you look at these Old Testament verses, you'll see that God was referring to a new heart, a renewed heart, a purified heart, a pure heart with no impurity or cleanness. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. Here it says, A new heart also will I give you. It was telling them the provision of their fathers for them. Good, important, wonderful, yet not enough. What the one who circumcised their flesh did for them was not enough. The Lord himself will give them a new heart. And then he says, a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. Was telling them the necessity of the gracious removal of the inborn depravity and then the necessity of divine replacement with a tender, transformed, 
this position. Matthew chapter 5. Reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Here Christ now comes to emphasize. That after verse 5. After verse 3. They were poor in spirit. After verse 4. They mourned. For they discovered, recognized unrighteousness. After verse 5, meek to inherit the earth. After verse 6, hungry and righteous and thirsty after righteousness. After verse 7, a work of grace had been done. They were saved. They were now merciful. And they're going to keep on obtaining mercy. Since they see something else. That the Lord will do. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. The gracious oppression. Of the Lord himself. That cleanses the inner man. Seeing God. Without any cloud. In between. It's talking about. The circumcision of heart. That results. In. A clear. Good, cleansed conscience. First Timothy chapter 1. Reading from verse 5. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Now, the end of the commandment, or that means it's the goal of the commandment, the aim of the commandment, the end result of the commandment is charity. Out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of faith and faith, it results in a good conscience and faith life that is transparent, unpretending, on faith. In First Peter chapter one, verse twenty-two. First Peter chapter one, verse twenty-two. It says, see, ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. It says, unto unfeigned, unpretending love of the brethren. See, that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Pure heart fervently. And so, we can see the intention of the Lord, the desire of the Lord, the demand of the Lord. It wasn't just outward religion that the Jews were holding on to. And Paul now brought conviction to them, saying that the outward thing was not sufficient. But the Lord wanted a gracious work of the Lord. In their heart, the necessity of heart circumcision. There are three things we're looking at as we look at Romans chapter 2, verses 17 to 29. Number one, the condemnation of circumcised hypocrites. The condemnation of circumcised hypocrites. Number two, the consideration. Of uncircumcised heathen. The consideration of uncircumcised heathen. And then number three, the comprehension of the circumcised heart. The comprehension of the circumcised heart. Welcome to number one, the condemnation of circumcised hypocrites. Let's look at it from verse 17, Romans chapter 2, verse 17. It's going to conclude that these circumcised Jews were just mere circumcised hypocrites. That the circumcision of the flesh had not really made them the children of God and the people that please the Lord. Look at Romans chapter 2 verse 17. Behold, 
that was called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast in God, and knowest his will. As for head knowledge, you are a Jew, you know his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent. You seem to understand the demand of God more excellently than the heathen, than the Gentiles, being instructed out of the law. You have a kind of law that the Gentiles did not have. And you have been instructed, the fathers have passed on to their children. And the children have passed on to their children too, from generation to generation. Now in verse 19, are not confident that thou art thyself a guide of the blind. You think you have graduated. And you think you are no more a student. You are a scholar. You are a lecturer. You are a leader. You are a guide of the blind. And a light to them that are in darkness. You elevate yourself. You exalt yourself. You are not like the Gentiles. The Gentiles are in darkness. And you are in the light. And now you want to show them the light. In verse 20, an instructor of the foolish. They counted the Gentile people as foolish. And they just stood in the place of an instructor. A teacher of babes which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Now therefore, we teach us another, a Jew, trying to teach the Gentile. Teach us thou not thyself, that the preachers a preacher. A man should not steal. You tell the people, the law of God says, thou shalt not steal. Dost thou steal, thou that sayest, a man should not commit adultery? Dost thou commit adultery, thou that abhorrest idols? Dost thou commit sacrilege, thou that makest thy boast of the law? Through the breaking of the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is reaching. Here Paul the Apostle was calling the Jewish people to conviction and to realization and to honesty. And he's saying, I mean, Jew like you are. And we Jews, we know the law. And those of us who have been Pharisees were rejoiced in this circumcision. Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, it says in verse 3, For we are the circumcision. He's talking about the believers which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. We have no confidence in the flesh because all that the flesh had offered, the circumcision the flesh had offered, profited nothing. Verse 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man among these Jewish people thinketh he has Whereof he might trust in the flesh. I more. And what of the boast of those Pharisees, of those Jewish people, verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me when the light shone, when the truth penetrated, when the way was made clear, when heart circumcision was put on stage as a real demand, the things I rejoiced in before. I thought were profitable, those things I now count loss for Christ. 
It's telling us that those circumcised people were just hypocrites. But he wasn't the first one. The prophets had told them, but they were not listening. In Isaiah chapter 48, Isaiah chapter 48, reading from verse 1, hear, the, hear ye this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah which swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth. Isaiah convicted them of hypocrisy, circumcised, but they were hypocrites, and not in righteousness. For they called themselves of the holy city and stayed themselves Upon the God of Israel, the Lord of hosts is his name. But even though they rejoiced in circumcision, look at verse 8. Yea, thou hadest not. Yea, thou knewest not. Yea, from that time that thine ear was not opened, for I knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb that's what David affirmed he said in sin did my mother conceive me in sin iniquity was I born he was their king and he said yes we are Jews but we know we don't have that inward righteousness by the circumcision. All we have is a pretended righteousness. Look at verse 18. In verse 18 it says, Oh, that thou was hearkening to my commandments, then at thy peace being as a river, and thy righteousness are the waves of the sea. But they said, no, they didn't have that. They were hypocritical, circumcised Jews. In Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1, if they had listened to their prophets, they would have come out of that hypocrisy long ago. Chapter 58, verse 1, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a prophet and show my people their transgression. My people because they call themselves by the name of the Lord. Yet he said their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation the deed righteousness. They forsook not the ordinance of their God. Those outward things, the Passover, they kept on observing that. Circumcision, they kept on observing that. And the sacrifices, they kept on observing that. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take the light in approaching to God. Yet, he said, lift up your voice like a trumpet. I show them their transgression. Jeremiah chapter 9. In Jeremiah chapter 9, reading from verse 25 and verse 26, here, here Jeremiah becomes very direct as he now talks to them about their uncircumcised state. Chapter 9, verse 25. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will punish all them which are circumcised. I will punish all them which are circumcised, the Jews, with the uncircumcised, the Gentiles. They're going to have the same judgment because the circumcision of the Jew did not reach beyond their flesh. 
Verse 26. Egypt and Judah. Egypt. That's Gentile. Judah. That's Jewish. Edom. And the children of Ammon. And of Moab. And all that are in the uttermost corners. That dwell in the wilderness. For all these nations. Gentile. As uncircumcised. And all the house of Israel Jews are uncircumcised in the heart. Uncircumcised in the heart. And so you will see what God wanted. What he desired. What he demanded. Circumcision of the heart. But he remained hypocrites. We're looking at Acts chapter 7. From verse 51. Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Ye stiff neck, ye uncircumcised in heart. And so you understand, it wasn't the first time Paul talking to the Jews that the real thing that matters is not that outward circumcision, it's the inward circumcision of the heart. Ye stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye do not only really now always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did in the uncircumcised state, so do ye in your uncircumcised state. Verse 53 Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. That's what the Lord was telling. Uh, the Jewish people, Matthew chapter 23. As you look at Matthew chapter 23, the Lord emphasized the same thing. The Pharisees were the people that projected themselves as the teachers of the people, the leaders of the people, the instructors of the people, the guides of the people in the way. And they rejoiced in their outward sign of circumcision and religion. See what the Lord said. Matthew chapter 23, in verse 4, it says, They bind heavy bodies, and grievous to be born, and laid them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one finger. They were preaching hard messages, top messages, great messages, expositions of the law. But they themselves could not do what they were emphasizing. Preachers who could not practice. All they could say is, do as I say, but don't do as I do. Look at verse 5. All the works they do to be seen of men. All they wanted was public recognition without private righteousness. What God was looking for was inward righteousness. Private righteousness. That in your heart, in your mind, your soul, in your spirit, you're righteous. All they wanted was public recognition. Let's look at verse 6. And love, greetings, love, the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogue they wanted public honor they were so conscious about position position consciousness but not purifying consecration and that's what the lord was saying your religion is just for yourself that circumcision is just for yourself it makes you hypocritical Look at verse 7. In verse 7, And greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. They wanted honor from men, and not the honor that came from God only. We come to verse 12. In verse 12, it says, And whosoever shall exalt himself, shall be abased and he shall and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted they were proud before men rather than 
being humble before men. Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16 verse 15. It says, and he said unto them, Ye are they. Ye are they. The word religion, ye are they. They cover themselves with the hypocrisy of religion. Ye are they. We justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. For they, for that which is highly esteemed among men, is abomination in the sight of God. Matthew chapter 23. We're reading from verse 13. In verse 13 it says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering in to go in. Those Pharisees are hypocrites. Terrible hypocrites. They will not allow another person to teach, to lead, to guide, to show the way. We're here already. We're the instructors already. And we're the teachers of the babes already. We're the guide of the ignorant already. But you know what they did? They will preach forcefully about the thing that will not take anybody to heaven. They preach about the circumcision. They'll preach about the outward garment. They'll preach about the outward things. They'll preach about all those prayers they were praying themselves. And they'll preach on things that will not touch the heart, will not convict the heart, will not transform the heart. They'll preach forcefully and fervently sweating. And yet, the important thing that will allow people to get to the kingdom of God. They will not talk that, Nicodemus. Are you a ruler, a master, a teacher in Israel? And you do not know this basic thing, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, what do you teach? Gamaliel, what were you teaching Saul? And you taught him and taught him and taught him. And he sat at your feet all those many years. And then he grew up only to fight the way that leads to life everlasting. They shot the kingdom of God against others by their teaching. And they're not people that teach today. They teach every week. They preach everywhere. They preach on the field. They preach in the valley. They preach everywhere. What are they preaching? Do they touch repentance? Do they touch Born again experience? Do they talk in righteousness? Do they teach follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord? And yet they engage their people. Every week they engage their people and they tell them we're going to study the word of God through the study. And they read. But what they read never gets them to transformation of life. The short the kingdom of heaven against men. They themselves are not entering in. And they are not allowing other people to enter in. Verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye devour widows' houses. And for a pretense, make long prayer. Therefore shall ye receive the greater damnation. There are people that specialize in uh, traditional praying. Once before they, were, before they were born, their daddy, their mommy, they were in a prayer house. Prayer, 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 prayer. Every time. Pray the day and pray the night. They don't pray in repentance. They don't pray to be born again. They don't pray to have the grace of God in their lives and have a change of life. But prayer, prayer, prayer. And you find people that pray. They pray, Lord, traditional prayer, but not transformational prayer. Look at Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, reading from verse 12. 
in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, here is praying. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayer. What's a prayer? That she may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And then not uh, people like these uh, Pharisees that are rising up in our church. And they hinder people from coming to the Bible study. Because they are praying, they are praying, they are praying. And they are not people in our church that hinder uh, our own members from coming to Thursday Revival Evangelism Training Service. Because they are praying and praying and praying. And they are not people that hinder our own people from coming for the weekend revival. Because the Lord has told them that this mountain will not move. It's not the mountain of sin, the setting sin, or the weakness of the people. No, they just want to pray. They want to pray. And they'll pray walking up and down. They'll pray shaking their heads. And they'll pray lying on the ground. They'll pray rolling on the ground. They'll pray running. They'll pray boxing. There. They'll pray. They'll pray all through the night. And they won't allow people to come and hear the word of God. That will lead them to life eternal. They'll fast. They'll do everything religious hypocrites do. Praying, but the prayer is for pretense eventually. The lives of the people are not changed. And the people do not become better wives, better husbands because of the prayer. They don't become better Christians and better believers because of those prayers. They don't become better workers and better children of God because of those prayers. It's just the prayer of the Pharisees that do not touch the essential thing. Look at Matthew chapter 23 verse 15. Won't you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, circumcised hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land, to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. They were doing what we will call evangelism. Evangelism. Soul winning. But where were they winning those souls to? Jesus said, You hypocrites, you're busy at nothing. You're busy at something worse than nothing. And you go over land and sea to make one convert, one proselyte. And after his marriage, you become to full child of hell than yourself. It's a hell populating evangelism. Rather than heaven populating evangelism. If you do real evangelism, you're taking people out of the pit of sin, out of their degradation, out of their defilement, out of their evil, and you're bringing them to the side of Christ, preparing them for heaven, a heaven populating evangelism. In their own case, it was a hell populating evangelism. Come now to look at verse 16. Want you, ye blind guides, well, guides of the ignorant. That's what Paul was convicting them of. Were well, the teachers of the babes, were well, the instructors of the ignorant. Want you, ye, ye blind guides, which say, Whatsoever, whosoever shall swear by the temple, it's nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple he is a debtor are there not people that read the bible and they have knowledge of their own selected verses of the bible but it is for prosperity and they misinterpret everything the thing that should be interpreted to make us pure in heart and to make us obedient to god 
to make us loyal to God. The interpretation is, you know, if you sow this, if you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you will reap life everlasting. We know what that means. But now, they are going to interpret it. As you sow the seed, and it come to the seed, and it come to the money, and it come to the multiplication, and it come to the, uh, to the prosperity. Everywhere they go in the Bible, no matter what that scripture is saying, they will always interpret it, you know, if you come, you'll be rich. If you do this, you'll be rich. Wherever they go, that's what they do. And the Lord says that you people that are just misinterpreting the word of God and the law of God only for prosperity. You may join that. It tells us verse 23. In verse 23 of Matthew chapter 23, won't you? Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, justice, mercy, faith, these sought ye to have done and not to leave the order undone, ye blind guides that strain at a knot. And swallow a camel. You understand? Strain at a knot. What that means is, if they wanted to drink their unfermented wine, and then the foam on top of that unfermented wine has a little insect. That's the knot there. You strain it out, just that little thing. While you do that, in drinking that cup of juice and you strain out that little knot that little insect you swallow up a camel how hypocritical they were they were meticulously careful of minor little small insignificant things a button is missing meticulously careless or careful about that little thing a little pain meticulously careful a little thing to add to this or take away from that the strange at a knot but then they swallowed a camel they were careless on major major issues that would determine people getting to heaven or going to hell. It was all outward religion. Those Pharisees, those circumcised hypocrites. Look at verse 25. Just outward, want to use scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye may clean the outside of the cup, outside, and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. And there are people like those Pharisees. Their religion is on Sunday in the church. Repentance, prayer, righteousness, holiness, dressing, whatever, just on Sunday. As they leave the church on Sunday, they leave all that, they hang all that in the church. They go to the working place, to their workplace on Monday. You can't see that evidence of repentance. You can't see that evidence of holiness. And they do other things you cannot see. The evidence. Or it's just religion. Out of religion. And these were circumcised hypocrites. Verse 26. You blind Pharisee. Cleanse first. That which is within the car. And platter. That the outside of them may be clean also. Want you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outside, but within. You think of your own faith as an inner expression of glory and praise unto the Lord. Do you understand that you came into the kingdom not to impress me, not to impress her, not to impress them? 
you came into the kingdom to offer your heart unto the Lord and that the thing that really matters is not what I see of you it is what God himself knows about you about your inner man because these walls they appeared beautiful outward but within they are full of dead men's bones of all, of all uncleanness verse 28 even so he also outwardly appear righteous unto men but within he are full of hypocrisy and iniquity Paul the apostle was not saying something totally new Isaiah said it Jeremiah said it Ezekiel said it Amos said it Osea said it and all those prophets of olden days days gone by they said it and now Jesus emphasized it. Verse 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Being a circumcised hypocrite, that's not enough. We come to point number two. The consideration of uncircumcised heathen. The consideration of uncircumcised heathen is coming now to prove to them that they thought they were the righteous ones without grace righteous without inward cleansing righteous without the work of grace in their hearts in their lives he said the gentiles should despise you might be surprised you will be surprised that they're having the work of grace done in them their hearts have been circumcised. It tells us in Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 25, For circumcision verily profites, if, on condition, thou keep the law. But, if thou be a breaker of the law, that circumcision is made on circumcision. Before you go on, Baptism, very late prophetess. If you live the righteous life that Christ has come to bring to us, that that baptism demonstrates that you are immersed, you are buried with Christ, and now you rise up in newness of life. If that happens, baptism is profitable. If it doesn't happen, now baptism is nothing. It's telling us, taking the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, verily profiteth. If thou be a new creature, but if thou be a breaker of the commandments of God, the Holy Communion is nothing in the sight of the Lord. There are people that make it a duty. Those things are very important to them. What about baptism? Confirmation in the church, recognition in the church, having their seat, their position in the church, and paying the church due, the pastor's due, and making way for themselves so the priest will say the right thing when they come for their funeral ceremony. All those things, they profit something if you are a keeper of the word of God. But if you break out the word of God, all those things mean nothing. I belong to a Bible-believing church. That's great. If that Bible-believing church, your membership there, granted you a new heart, a new life, conversion, change of life, transformation of your soul, and holiness of heart, but he belonging to that Bible believing church does not do that. It's worthless. I belong to a very firm denomination. That's great. If the firmness brings conformity to the word of God in your life, if it does not, that is unprofitable. I'm involved in ministerial service. Great. What an opportunity for you. You are in material service here at the Congress. If that brings the purging, 
the purifying, the change and transformation of heart and life, good and profitable. If attending the Congress, I'm always there. Nothing will take me away from there. It's my right. It's my privilege. I enjoy it. And I can tell you, from this year to this year, I've never missed a Congress. Uh-uh. Don't rejoice in that. What has that Congress done in your heart, in your life? That's what matters. Because you can make that like circumcision. The ministerial opportunity is like circumcision. The title, title in the church, or title anywhere, if that grants you the ticket to heaven, if that title helps you to have holiness, holiness of heart, that will take you to heaven, wonderful, profitable. But if that title has a reverse kind of impact on you that not because of the title every time you look at your title and then you look at who you are and say isn't this something that you can be so and so such and such in a church like this deep and live bible church the title has ruined you has destroyed you because you are near the fire of revival and yet you stink you are cold you do not have what that office what that position in such a church like this should have done for you the higher you go the more sinful you become what a pity just like those Jewish people look at verse 26 therefore if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? He's talking about those many Jews, those many Gentiles. He has gone to, and then he has declared the gospel unto them. And now their lives are changed. There were some of them in Rome. There are some of them in Thessalonica. There were some of them in the islands of Crete. There were some of them in Iconium. There were some of them in the other Antioch. That is the Antioch in the Gentile world. They were uncircumcised, but they were saved. They were transformed. They were changed. And conversion had come unto them. And these other people, circumcised, 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 hypocrites, no, they had not urged that. And let's look at these uh, Gentiles in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, uh, verse 3. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of of the Gentiles, uncircumcised in the flesh, but they were converted, they were transformed, their lives had changed, and was seen Jewish people, circumcised flesh, or circumcised heart, consider the situation of the Gentiles, they were converted, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading here from verse 5, this were Gentiles, for our gospel came not unto you in words only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. And ye became followers of us. Gentiles, Gentiles, ye became followers of us. And of the Lord, followers of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. There were also Gentiles that had believed in Macedonia and Achaia. And these people, uncircumcised in the flesh, they were circumcised in the heart. For from you sounded out 
the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we urge unto you how ye turned to God from idols they were Gentiles but they turned away from idols there was the work of grace in their hearts a change in their lives in their disposition a change that was reflected outwardly you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come and so Paul the apostle brought conviction upon those Jewish people that what you have not got the Gentiles are getting these Gentiles are converted these Gentiles are cleansed these Gentiles are conformed to Christ and these Gentiles these Gentiles are being prepared for glory in heaven but if thou be a breaker of the law you are lawless circumcised disobedient yet circumcised unrighteous yet circumcised unholy yet circumcised ungodly yet circumcised unfaithful yet circumcised disqualified for heaven even though you are circumcised your circumcision is made of circumcision that means then those who come to know the Lord and they have a change of heart, a change of life. There's uncircumcision recounted as circumcision. We're looking at Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised. Or the circumcision made without hands, spiritual, heavenly, divine, by grace, by the Lord Himself in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And in that way now, they're able to do the will of God able to serve the purpose of God able to know the experience that Christ purchased on the cross of Calvary and now they'll be ready for heaven we're coming back to Romans chapter 2 point number one is the condemnation of circumcised hypocrites point number two the consideration of uncircumcised heathen now number three the comprehension of the circumcised heart the comprehension the understanding of the circumcised heart and in verse 28 for he is not a Jew the real Jew an acceptable Jew an approved Jew a Jew on his way to heaven no it's not a Jew which is one outwardly neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh but he is a Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God see what the Lord is emphasizing through Paul the Apostle it says the outward thing that men look at 
and makes you so busy polishing the external, improving on the external, always taking care of the external. He says, that doesn't matter too much to God. For Samuel chapter 16, reading from verse 7. For Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said, Samuel, look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. There are many people that think that the end of their deeper life identification is their outward dressing. For the men, you know what you look for. For the women, you know what you look for? That's where some people stop. There are some people that feel that they are being qualified by man. They passed the test. The examination of a man. Asking questions. This, they answer. This, they answer. That, they answer. And that outward kind of appearance brings them into the workforce. They have now arrived. Hypocrisy in the heart, but they have arrived. Evil thought in the heart, but they have arrived. And unrighteousness in behavior, but they have arrived. Because now they have the badge. And they have the mark that they're looking for outward. There are people that think that although they may say it, that preaching does not take us to heaven. Service does not take us to heaven. Being this, being that does not take us to heaven. They say that, but they don't believe that. They don't believe that. Privately in their hearts, they're just like our old, old grandfathers and grandmothers. What I have done, what I have, the work of my hand, I give clothes to that. I give food to that. I give this to that. And when God will look at all those good works, outward things, He will accept me to heaven. Mama, no. Papa, not really. Except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. The works of the flesh are manifest. And as long as those works are there, you are not ready for heaven. But there must be the fruit of the Spirit. It's coming from the heart. For man looketh on the outward life. But within the full of hypocrisy and extortion. Inward. Within. Psalm 5 verse 9. In Psalm 5 verse 9. There is no faithfulness in their mouth. They are in what part is very wickedness. Why don't you get serious and get busy? Let that be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Psalm 62, reading from verse 4, what God is looking for. Psalm 62, reading from verse 4. Here yeah, it tells us the only consort. To cast him down from his excellency, they delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. And that's what God is looking for. It's not the outward expression alone that people can say that's the picture of a gentle man. He blesses people. It's nice to people inwardly. Inwardly, they curse. They're very helpful. They're very profitable. In fact, if everybody were like them, the world would be a better place. Uh -uh. If everybody were hypocritical like them, the world would be a worse place. Because they bless outwardly, but they curse 
inwardly. It tells us in Psalm 64, reading from verse 6, 64, verse 6. They search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search, but inwardly, the inward thought of every one of them and the heart is deep. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly shall they be wounded. You see that? They search out things. And if you really want to have the outcome of research, go to them. Religious research. But you know what? Inwardly, they're so bad, they're evil, and you know, a bad intention, an evil intention. They want to bring other people down. The jealousy is there, the envy is there, the pride is there. And if there's anybody that will take position from them or take their position, in a way they'll see how to cut him down, get rid of him. God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly shall they be wounded. You know why? God is looking for inward holiness, inward righteousness. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. The way of false prophets. Well, it's going to be difficult to identify them because they come to you in sheep's clothing. They're nice on the outside. They're polished externally. They know the ethics. They know the acceptable things. And they know what you want to hear. They know what you want to see. They know what you're expecting. They'll say what you want to hear. They'll do what you want to see. But inwardly, the ravening wolves. They may not get you something. And once they get that, catch that, keep that, they've got what they wanted now. The inward righteousness will not be there. But God says, no, that's not a real child of God. That's not a real Jew. The one that's a real Jew is one inwardly circumcised in the heart, circumcised in the spirit. Psalm 51, reading from verse 1, verse 6. Psalm 51, verse 6. Behold, the desirous truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part that shall make me to know wisdom. And because I know it's that inward thing experience you are looking for, purge me with his soul. And I shall be clean, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 73, verse 1. Psalm 73, verse 1. Truly, God is good to Israel. Even to such as of a clean heart. The real Israel, they are such that of a clean heart. Verse 25. These are the people that say and demean it, O my in heaven but thee. And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. It says, I'm not an Absalom. Looking for power, position, authority. I don't desire anything here on earth. All I want is this inward treasure. Whom I buy in heaven but thee. And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. Jeremiah chapter 31. In Jeremiah chapter 31, reading from verse 33. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. 
After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. You see what's essential to God? What God is looking for? This Old Testament, that's what he wanted to do. Circumcision, that's just the outward thing. But now, something inward, an inward experience, a purged heart, a purified heart, a cleansed heart, a circumcised heart, and he deposits his law, not on the tables of stone, but on their very hearts. And he says there, I write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Hebrews chapter 8. In Hebrews chapter 8, reading from verse 6, But now, as he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Verse 10, For this is the covenant, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 14. Here yeah, it tells us, For by one offering, He has perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that, He had said, after that, He had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. That's the purpose of the Lord, and that's part to do that. We'll come back to this promise again in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, reading from verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30, reading from verse 6. Remember, circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not possessed by the Jews, neither sought by them, nor obtained by the religious world, nor praised, appreciated by mere church attendees, but is praised by God, and He wants us. To seek until we obtain, to receive and to retain, to consecrate and to maintain this purity of heart, circumcision of heart, sanctification experience, holiness of heart, circumcision of heart. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6 And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. Who will do the circumcision of heart? I said, who will do the circumcision of heart? But notice this, the Lord thy God. You must have been saved. It is salvation that makes him the Lord thy God. And because he is the Lord thy God, who has converted us, the Lord thy God who has cleansed us. The Lord thy God who has saved us. The Lord thy God who has changed our lives. Now, he wants to go further. Because he doesn't want to, to rest in outward religion alone. So, he will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed. And when he does that, we love him without allowing any rival. We love him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind and all our strength, that thou mayest live. You live with him here on earth, 
you live with him in heaven. I thought you'll say, Amen. Amen. That's what he wants us to seek. He wants us to pray for. He wants us to receive. He wants us to retain. He wants us to maintain. He wants us to consecrate until the Lord comes and he circumcises our hearts. If we don't have that circumcision of heart, all else will fade into insignificance. If all we have is outward, if all we have is opportunity for this, privilege of that, privilege of that, without circumcision of heart, holiness of heart, purity of heart, the rest might even be injurious unto you. Let's come to the throne of grace. He has grace, grace to save, grace to sanctify, and he has the power to circumcise our heart. We we'll call upon him, lay everything on the altar, he will do it. Faithfully see who has called you, who also will do it. Let's come now and present ourselves to the Lord in prayer. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. And let him do this great work in us. This wonderful thing in us. He wants to circumcise. He wants to sanctify. He wants to purify our hearts. He's able. Let him do it.